Welcome uh, everyone back to 264A Automated Reasoning. This is um, our lecture three. So what we'll do today is we will start by continuing our discussion on resolution. We will uh, end that discussion and complete it uh, by discussing directed resolution, which is uh, a particular resolution strategy that uh, we mentioned last time is uh, special in a number of ways. Uh, one of these is historical reasons. Uh, this uh, algorithm of directed resolution was proposed by David and uh, Davis and Putnam. Uh, uh, a while back as a way of uh, checking consistency and, um, and therefore satisfiability, it's actually also known as the DP algorithm. Uh, then they realized that it has some uh, demanding space requirements and later with uh, Longman and uh, Loveland, they developed something known as the DPLL algorithm for satisfiability, very famous. Uh, it has modest space requirements and that end up being the basis of uh, satisfiability solvers. So there is DP and there is DPLL and uh, between DPLL and modern SAT solvers, there is a whole bunch of developments that took place. We'll go over those. So today we'll start with directed resolution, that is DP, and uh, then we will move into uh, chapter three, which is dedicated to DPLL plus uh, modern um, SAT solvers. All right, so I need to go now to the uh, whiteboard to start a discussion. So I'm going to turn my camera uh, off and I'll be starting in just a second. So we're starting with the discussion of um, directed resolution. And as I mentioned, this is also known as the DP algorithm for uh, Davis and Putnam. Now, as we mentioned earlier, uh, directed resolution can be thought of as a resolution strategy. And what resolution strategies do is they restrict the set of resolutions that you can take. And the idea is to focus the resolution process and perhaps avoid some unnecessary resolution steps. So what we need to do is start with what kind of restrictions uh, does directed resolution suggest? And for that, we need first the notion of a P resolvent. P here is a variable. And what a p-resolvent is, uh, is a clause that result from resolving two clauses, one containing p and the other containing not p. So basically, when we resolve on the variable b, p, uh, the result is known as a p-resolvent. So if we had these uh, two clauses, let's say a not b, and the other one is B, C, not D, and we go ahead and resolve on the variable B, then we will get um, A, C, not D, and that's what we would call a B resolvent. Okay, <clears throat> so now here are the restrictions of directed resolution. First, you need to have a variable ordering, you pick that as you wish, uh, doesn't matter which one you pick as far as uh, the correctness of the algorithm. So let's say we're gonna have the variables ordered like this, P1, P2, all the way to Pn. There's basically two rules. The first one of them basically says that P, P sub J resolvents should be generated only after all PI resolvents have been generated. And here, uh, basically J is greater than I. So what this means is um, you start first by doing the resolution on variable P1, and then after that you do resolutions on variable P2, and then on P3 and so on. You have to follow this particular order, but there's actually another restriction which may sound surprising at first. And that is the generation of PJ resolvents cannot involve clauses that mention uh, variables PI again, where um, J is greater than I. So this looks like quite restrictive. Um, 
what the second one says is, so let's say you go ahead and um, you did resolutions on P1. When you go ahead and do resolutions on P2, you cannot involve clauses that mention P1. Don't include them. Even if they lead to legitimate resolutions, don't do these resolutions. And, and similarly, if you go to P3 and you are now doing uh, resolutions on P3, do not include clauses that mention P2 or P1, all right? So that's quite restrictive in a sense. And we'll take a concrete example in just a little bit, but that gets you wondering uh, under these uh, restrictions, uh, would directed resolution still be complete or is directed resolution complete? And yes, uh, directed resolution is refutation complete for any variable ordering, all right? Now, here's the interesting thing. So not only it remains co refutation complete, and what that means as we discussed last time, um, it is guaranteed to find a contradiction uh, in the knowledge base if one exists, but it's also refutation complete for any variable ordering. Now, where it ends up making a difference uh, as far as which variable ordering to use, uh, that ends up being related to the amount of work that the algor algorithm end up doing. So there are some variable orderings that lead to less work than others. And we will say something about this um, later. <clears throat> so let's take a concrete example uh, next and uh, tell you more about directed resolution because as we mentioned last time, uh, it is an interesting algorithm in the sense that it does uh, leave behind it uh, quite a bit of information which can be used for other purposes beyond um, doing sets viability. Okay, so here's a little knowledge base. And what we have here is a number of clauses. This is the first one. This is a binary clause and another binary clause. And um, this guy here. Okay, and let me make sure I got everything right here as far as this um, knowledge base. So we have not A, B, not A, C, not B, D, not C, D, and um, okay. Right, now what we do is uh, take a, a, an example of how this works. And then what we'll see after that is there is a nice mechanical way of conducting directed resolution uh, that makes it easy for uh, a person or a human to actually go through the step quite uh, uh, in a structured way. So in this case, we're going to assume that uh, the variable ordering that we have is uh, C, B, A, uh, D, E. That's the variable ordering. And therefore, we have to start by doing resolutions on C. So if we're trying to do resolutions on C, uh, let's see, how many uh, possible resolutions do we have? <clears throat> we basically have to look for the clauses that mention C. So here's one of them. This mentions C and there are two others that mention not C. So in principle, I can resolve this with that, right? And that will give me not A and not D. Um, I can also try to resolve this guy with this guy. Now, what happens if I resolve this with that? Um, so I have here not, I have C and I have not C. They can cancel. Now, if I do that, uh, what I'm going to get is not A from this part. Now, look what I'm going to get here. I'm going to get A here and then E. Now, we didn't mention this, I think, explicitly before. But in this case, I have not A and A, this is a clause. So that's not A or A or E, which is basically true. Uh, these are basically trivial uh, clauses. We don't include them. There's no point of including these. So basically we will say that this particular resolution step is not something that we will actually do. And therefore um, we only have one resolvent in this particular case. Now, if we go next, to the variable B because we're following the order, right? So we will find how many 
resolvents do we have? Uh, where is variable B? Here's variable B. Where else does it appear? It only appears here. So it only appears in two clauses. I can resolve uh, these two guys together. Now, here you have to make sure for this step to be valid, uh, according to directed resolution, I have to make sure that these two clauses do not mention what, which variable. Um, so people here actually did something better than what I did. They numbered these implicitly. Uh, let me do that too. And uh, in this case, okay, I'm gonna resolve one and three because I'm doing resolutions over B. The, the question is for that to be a legitimate resolution step according to directed resolution, what do I need to make sure? People are saying, I wanna make sure that C does not appear there. And indeed that does not appear. So now let me go ahead and uh, do that particular step. And then I'm gonna get basically uh, not A and D. Good, and then you go to uh, A after that. And now the question is, uh, what can I resolve in this case? A appear in one, two, and five. Any legitimate resolution steps in that particular case? So I can do one and five, and that would not be legitimate, right? Because if you look at uh, one and, and five, they do mention variables that I already handled. And then if I try to do uh, two and five, similarly, they do mention C. So basically in this case, no legitimate um, resolutions, right? Even though I could have done some. And then similarly, if you go to, uh, D after that, uh, let's see, where does D appear? D appears in two of these guys right here, three and four. Uh, similarly, uh, those mention a clause uh, variables that I already handled, so no legitimate resolutions. And finally, I have the variable E and let's see, um, <clears throat> no resolutions here because E appears only in five. I don't have, I have E, I don't have not E. So basically we are done. and. The point is, uh, look what happened here. I basically just did two, two resolution steps, that's it. And I finished the amount of the, the work and I did not find an empty clause. Um, and therefore the knowledge base is consistent or satisfiable. Um, and that's a guarantee by directed resolution, right? So I avoided quite a bit of work and I still managed actually to, um, uh, prove uh, satisfiability in this particular case. Now, what we'll see next is um, a particular uh, mechanization of directed resolution. It is something that is known as bucket elimination. In a sense, it's simply a certain way to conduct this algorithm systematically. It also structures the process in a way that allows us to uh, do various things uh, based on the output of this directed resolution process. So we're gonna do that, but just let me mention upfront, what's gonna happen is now that we do bucket elimination and uh, just find a way to do directed resolution in a more structured way, we will find that by the time that finishes, there will be information that is left that we can use to do other things. And one of these things uh, is uh, existentially quantifying variables. We will find out that uh, in the process of doing uh, directed resolution, we have computed a whole bunch of existential quantifications. The other thing has to do with uh, being able to generate what is known as decision trees. Uh, that characterize the models of the um, CNF that we have. And we'll see that by the time we finish directed resolution, uh, the leftover work or information will facilitate the construction of that decision tree, which has other uh, uses we will uh, mention there. So that's what we are heading to next. And what I would like to do uh, now is basically uh, put another example, I think it is another example. Let's see, it's the same, it's uh, actually the same example and try to do it in a, a structured way using bucket elimination. So let's go ahead and erase something here. Uh, I'm gonna erase this part. 
And the goal here is to go ahead and talk about what is known as bucket elimination. Okay, let me first quickly see if there is any questions before we move um, into this part. All right, so one question is that it would be impossible to resolve over variable E, uh, right. So anytime a variable appears in only one sign, that means we cannot do resolutions over it. Um, let me see if there is any addition. Okay, so there's a question about whether we can uh, get any additional information uh, by changing the variable ordering and deferring solutions with other previous solutions. Okay, we're gonna get to this. So when we see uh, basically, uh, we'll, we'll get to the ordering, variable orderings and how they impact things in a little bit. But let's, because that will become actually easier to do once we go over uh, bucket elimination. So bucket elimination is pretty simple. It says, <clears throat> pick up your variable ordering. And let's say in this case, we did uh, the variable ordering is C, B, um, A, D, E. And now that we have this guy, it says, go ahead and, and build a set of buckets. Uh, buckets is effectively according to this order. So they're gonna look like this. And, um, and what's gonna happen is we're gonna put the clauses in these buckets, all right? So we, we do these buckets. Uh, maybe I should have a line, uh, dry green. I will never use green. It's an underrepresented color. Um, here we have this, and the idea is I'm going to start by putting the clauses in these buckets according to the following rule. I, I pick a clause, and I walk down, and I put it in the first bucket where this variable appears in the clause. So if I'm looking at the first guy, it has A and B. I'm going to go down. It's not going to go here. I'm going to put it actually here. So, uh, and the reason is that's the first bucket whose variable appears in the clause. And then I'm gonna do AC. Now AC goes in here because C and C, and then it's not A and C, all right? And then we're gonna go to number three, and I have B and D, so that ends up landing here. Um, okay, so you tell me um, this clause, number four, which bucket will it fall into? Uh, every bucket has a name, which is a variable. So this goes into which bucket? It has to go into either bucket C or D, right? This guy. And it has to go into C because C is the first one. So then we have not C and not D. And then this very last one will also fall in that bucket, which is a not C and D. Okay. So now we have put the clauses into the corresponding buckets, and that's the rule. And now what bucket elimination says is you process the buckets from top to bottom. So you're going to go down this way. And what does it mean to process a bucket? Uh, let me actually extend these lines. Um, so what's going to happen now, I'm going to put a line here too. You'll see why in just a second. So what's going to happen is when you go ahead and process a bucket, you go and do every possible resolution on the variable of that bucket. So I'm going to start with the first one, and, and that's variable C. So I'm going to do all possible resolutions on C, but only involving clauses in that bucket. So I'm only going to consider these three clauses and do every possible resolution on C. So let's try that. Uh, this mentions C, these two guys mention not C. So I can resolve this with that. And then I'm going to get the clause not A, not D. Now, that's the last step, an interesting step here. Where do I put that clause? Where do I put the clause not A, not D? I would just go down and uh, use the same story, I will put it in the first bucket going downwards, whose variable appear in that clause. So uh, I'm going to put those guys on this side. So that's going to be not A and not D. All right. So in this case, if we're going to use um, um, the numbering, we well, maybe I should avoid the numbering. Okay. So that's basically what happened. Now, you can also Consider doing resolution between this and that, but as we said earlier, this actually leads to a trivial clause. So we're basically done. And then what you do is now that you're finished processing this bucket, you go to the next bucket, which is uh, B. And then same story. 
I will have to go and do every possible resolution on the variable B, but, but considering only these particular clauses in that particular bucket. And in this case, there's only one possible resolution. I resolve on B, I get not A and D. And where does uh, that go? Where does that clause go? <clears throat> this is the clause which is not AD. I'm going downwards. This is the first bucket that actually whose variable appears there. So I'm going to end up having here not A and D. OK, now what happens after that? Then I go to this bucket. And now everything is included. And I have to do every possible resolution on A. Well, no resolutions can be conducted on A, right? So empty, empty, I'm basically done, right? So we're this is now uh, over. Bucket elimination has finished its work. And uh, we did not get a contradiction. So it is actually consistent. And the, the result when we add these guys here, this is known as the directed extension. Um, and what we'll see is these clauses that we've added will be valuable in certain ways that we'll exploit in, in just a little bit. Okay, before I say more about this, again, let me see if there's any questions. Um, someone is asking about the order of the buckets. You can pick up any order that you want. And that will be fine as far as uh, the guarantee that um, directed resolution is refutation complete. However, we'll see in a little bit that the specific order that you use may influence the amount of work that you do. Some orders are better than others in terms of the amount of work that they do. We will say more about this in a little bit. Uh, let's see, another question is, uh, uh, let me read it, this is a long question. Okay, someone is saying, is bucket elimination analogous to partitioning the graph into constituent cycles? Okay, there is a connection between which order to use for eliminating variables um, in bucket elimination and graphs. And we'll get to this later uh, today. Uh, another question is, uh, uh, so we never use this. No, when, when you are, so the question is, th these guys, do they end up participating in resolutions? Yes. So I, I just separated them so that you visually see what was original and what was added. But as we're going down the buckets and processing them, everything gets processed. So if you're doing resolutions on A, you, you consider everything, whether original or um, added. Okay. Let's do another quick example here. In fact, I'm going to do the same guy, uh, but I'm going to use a different variable order, and you're going to help me with that. Um, let me see. I cornered myself here by not leaving myself enough space. Uh, but we can probably squeeze something here. So here I'm going to use a different variable order. It's going to look smaller than this, but that is fine. Let's put a line here and let me put the buckets like this. So I'm doing a different variable order. I'm using E, A, and then B, and then C, and then D. So I want to give you a sense of what happens when you end up using um, a different variable order for the same problem, right? So let's call this here um, order one, variable order one, and let's call this uh, variable order two. Now, what uh, we need to do here is, um, okay, there's a whole bunch of questions that are being typed. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll get to these uh, after we finish this example. So folks, help me out here. Uh, here, here are the clauses, right? One, two, three, four, uh, five. And what I want you to do is uh, help me place these clauses in the buckets in this particular case. So let's start with clause one. And when you start with clause one, I have to put it in one of these buckets. Remember, we start from the top, go to the bottom, and then put it in the first bucket we 
go through whose variable appear in the clause. So this guy should go in which bucket? You give me the name of the bucket and people are saying A. So close one goes into bucket A and that's because that's the first bucket whose variable appears in the clause. Okay, close two, not A, C. Where does that go? Again, people are saying the same bucket. So that is not a C. Okay, let's do the third one. Uh, close three, where does close three go? Which bucket? And people are saying bucket B. Uh, this is close three, it goes in here. Uh, that is not B, D. Okay, two more clauses. Number four, where does number four go? C and D, we're gonna go down the C, right? So that goes in here. Uh, that is not C and um, not D. And we have one last clause, A not C, E. Number five, where does number five go? Okay, and people are saying it goes in the very first one, which is this guy, excellent. So this is A not C and E. Very good. So now we've got our clauses uh, in the corresponding buckets. And now we have to do uh, directed resolution. So we go down processing the buckets. We process E first, then A, then B, then C, then D. And remember, what do we do in each one? Uh, we, we're at E, we do every possible resolution over E and only involving clauses in that particular bucket. Okay, now we, let's see what happens when we look at E. Nothing can be done, right? There's only one clause anyways. You need two clauses at least to resolve. So we go to A. What happens here? Any resolution steps? Yes, no. Bucket A, you can say yes or no. Can we do any resolutions? We can't, right? So there's not A and not A. We, we need A and not A. Okay, nothing here. Okay, we go to B. Well, immediately no resolution steps. Why? Because there's only one clause. Okay, so what do we do now? We go to C. So again, no resolution steps. There's only one clause. Okay, and then D is empty. We're done. What happened here? Uh, we finished the work according to directed resolution. We did not find the contradiction. We actually, even though we did not do any work as far as uh, making resolution steps, what did we already prove? Uh, we, we effectively did uh, uh, prove that this knowledge base is actually consistent, all right? So uh, the point here is that this is the exact same example, same exact knowledge base, uh, but different variable orders, right? Uh, and you can see how the amount of work varied uh, depending on the order that we use. Very good. Um, let's now move on to what else we can do um, with, with directed resolution. Now, there is the question of what variable order to use uh, and to choose. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, <clears throat> uh, but let me first um, talk about uh, some of the uses of the information that is left uh, over or left after a resolution is uh, over. And, and you're gonna help me with that. So I'm gonna show you another example here and you can probably help me figure out, you know, what uh, further can we do with um, directed resolution. So this is now concerning uh, forgetting or what we called also existential quantification. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll look at an example. And in this example, I have this knowledge base, Delta, and this knowledge base has the following clauses or the following sentences, okay? So it's got these guys, A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, D implies Z. Let me ask you a question. Remember existential quantification. When we had there exist, uh, let's say X uh, delta. So I'm trying to existentially quantify X from delta. We gave uh, a definition for this, which was delta given X or um, delta given not X. This was the official definition, but uh, remember our discussion, it basically led to a formula or sentence that does not mention X and that uh, preserve every information that Delta had about other variables beyond X. And we looked at a concrete example there. I'm gonna try to do something before we move on to refresh our understanding of the intuition behind existential quantification. So if I had this Delta 
And I told you, let's go ahead and existentially quantify the variables B, the variable C, and the variable D. What do you think I'm going to get as a result? I want you to, don't apply the definition. This is going to be too tedious to do this definition. I want it based on the intuition that uh, when we uh, remove variables, we preserve information about the other variables. Uh, the other way of thinking about it is projection. So when I'm eliminating the variables or existentially qualifying B, C, D, the only variables left are A and E. So it's like taking this knowledge base and projecting it on the variables A and E. And in a, one way to think about this is what does this knowledge base say about A and E? That's effectively should be the result of existentially quantifying B, C, D. And here I should have put delta. So let me first make sure that my D is clear and then delta. So think about it. What do you think should be the result of existentially quantifying B, C, D or projecting on the variables A, E? Okay, someone is saying that it should be this, that A implies E that should be the result of existentially quantifying these three variables. And that is correct. Because, I mean, okay, think about it. This is saying A, B implies B, B implies C, C implies D, D implies E. So in a way, this knowledge base is saying that A implies E if you chain these. This is part of the information that is in this knowledge base. And uh, when I eliminate the other variables B, C, D, I expect that information to stay there. This because this information does not involve any of these variables. Uh, the question is, is there any other information about the variable A and E that is embedded in this knowledge base? And there is not. Okay, that's not as easy to see perhaps, but again, the whole point here was just to try to guess this, right? So it's not that this is something you can really do by visual inspection. Sometimes you can, uh, if you've seen enough of these. Uh, but I hope now this further furthers our... Um, uh, uh, basically intuition of what's going on. Now, the question that I'm going to ask you is the following. When we, uh, okay, so there's a good question and let me get to it first before I, I get to my point. The question is, what happens when we have multiple variables? Uh, very good point. Um, well, it's uh, simple. So if you are existentially quantifying first the variable, let's say X, so there exists X delta, you have this variable and that's a formula. And then you can go and do that exist Y from that. Okay, the thing that you should know is, and we didn't mention this and I'm glad there was a question. The order in which you existentially quantify variables doesn't matter. So if you do this, uh, then this is gonna be the same as that. So if you first existentially quantify X from Delta, and then you follow that by existentially quantifying the variable y, that's the same as doing y and then x. And because of that, we can write this. So because of that, you can go ahead and just simply say existentially quantify x, y, delta. And the order doesn't matter. So this is not ambiguous. Um, and you can actually, from the definition, convince yourself that the order doesn't matter. So you can expand this and expand this and see that they're actually... Uh, they would basically be um, the same. Okay, let me finish uh, this thought here uh, so we don't run out of time on this example. The I have this guy and I'm going to go and do bucket elimination using the following variable order. So C, B, D, and then A, and then E. And... I'm going to put the clauses directly, not B, C, and not C, D. And here I have not A, B, and here I have um, not D. Okay, these, these were the uh, clauses in the original knowledge base. So each one of these end up being a clause, and we just put them uh, basically in their corresponding buckets. If you actually go and run directed resolution, you're going to be adding a bunch of clauses. You're going to be adding not B, D here. And this will be not A, D here. And then this guy will have not A and D. Okay. So now we have our directed extension. We're done. And the question that I want to ask you is if you look at this um, directed extension, 
beyond the fact that I have actually shown that this knowledge base is consistent, what other information is embedded in this particular guy? And it, it has to do, as, as you can imagine or guess, it has to do with existential quantification. So, um, and let me remind you of also what we said last time about the interaction between resolution and uh, existential quantification. If you remember, we said, if you want to existentially quantify a variable from a CNF, let's say variable X, you can go and do all possible resolutions on that variable X, and then throw every clause that mention X. That will give you the same formula as applying this basic definition. Once more, we do every possible resolution on X and then we throw every clause that mention X. So the question I have for you, I went and did directed resolution and here they are. This knowledge base here that is made up of all of the clauses that appear in these buckets, can you express this as some kind of existential quantification on Delta, right? Can you try to tell me what does these clauses here represent in terms of some kind of a, you know, existential quantification of Delta? What did I do when I finished processing this guy? So when I finished processing this guy, I went and did every possible resolution on C, correct? I did every possible resolution on C and where did I put the results down there? Correct? So if you, okay, if you look at what happened here, you can think of these, and someone already wrote this, that I forgot the variable C. So this is their exist C delta. These clauses represent uh, the projection of the knowledge base on the variables B, D, A, and E. And because these are nothing but the result of having did every possible resolution on C, and then throwing away every clause that mentions C. And that's what we said is the interaction between um, basically resolution and existence quantification. Okay, let me now ask you another question. What about these guys? So I'm ignoring the first bucket and the second bucket. I'm just looking at the last three buckets. What does this uh, represent in terms of forgetting or existential quantification? Okay, someone is saying that would be forgetting B and C. There exist B, C, Delta, correct. So if you take your original knowledge base and say, forget the variable C and B, that's your answer, these three guys, or project on the variables D, A, and E, that's, yes. okay, let's, let's look at the very last one, uh, which is this guy here, these two buckets. And as you can imagine, this is basically, uh, there exist C, B, D. That is forget C, B, D, and that is Delta. And in fact, this is nothing but not A, E, which is A implies E, which we guessed earlier, okay? So what you have here is, a succession of uh, existential quantifications. Effectively, every time you're uh, processing a bucket, you are effectively forgetting that particular variable and you're moving down, forgetting the variables one at a time. And you'll see this also will play a role in the last application we're gonna mention. Um, now, uh, we have five minutes before the break. For that last application, I need more than five minutes. Um, so let me spend the next few minutes to say something about um, how we, you potentially pick up the variable order and this interaction between uh, directed resolution and graphs. Uh, but let me see. Um, okay, uh, the, the, the answers I uh, the answers to the questions I ask are intermingled with other questions. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so. That's, so this subject that I'm gonna mention now, uh, there is actually quite a long section in your uh, chapter on it. So we're not gonna go over that in detail. Um, we're gonna just sketch it. And it's a subject that we will have to come to later 
uh, in a pro perhaps a better context. Uh, but the main idea here, which we need to go over is the following. Uh, it, it has two sides to it. One side has to do with the use of graphs as abstractions of CNFs. And then what can you do with that? So if we have uh, this particular, uh, so let, let me write here the value of or uh, utility of using graphs. Um, when you have, let's say this particular knowledge base, Delta, it has the following clauses, let's say not A and B, not A, C. Okay, so we have these five clauses in this particular knowledge base. And the idea is we're going to try to construct a graph that gives us a sense of how these clauses interact. There are multiple ways of doing this, right? Uh, I'll show you the simplest way, which is known as uh, the primal graph of the CNF. I think in, in your notes, I refer to it as the interaction or the connectivity graph. So this particular graph abstraction of the CNF is very simple. Every variable in the CNF end up being a node in the graph. So we're gonna have uh, these nodes, okay? So every variable is a node. And then it's pretty simple. Anytime two variables appear in the same clause, I put an edge between them. So if you look at the first clause, it has A, B. So I'm gonna put an edge here. Then AC, then I'm gonna put an edge there. And then there is BD, that's an edge. And then there is CD, that's an edge. And then I have ACE. Okay, so three variables. In this case, I will put an edge between every pair of them. So AC, there's already an edge, AE, already an edge, CE. And that's what we have. So basically, because A, C, E appear in a same clause, I end up having basically a click over the variables A, C, E. Okay, so this is what's known as the primal graph. And as I mentioned in your notes, it's referred to as the connectivity graph um, or the interaction uh, graph. Now, we will just mention a couple of things briefly here. One of them is that there is a property of the graph called tree width which is a number that measures how dense the graph is or how interconnected. So this could be one, two, three, four, and so on. So for example, um, um, so trees have tree width of one, all right? So again, tree width is a number that um, kind of quantifies graph connectivity. This is a notion that comes from graph theory and is extremely well studied. We'll say more about it uh, later. And sometimes based on tree width, you can bound the complexity of the various algorithms. Directed resolution is one of them. So the space requirements of directed resolution uh, can be shown, if you pick up the right variable ordering, can be shown to be um, linear in the number of variables and exponential only in the tree width. Right, so this is number of vars, and this is tree width. So what that means is, for example, if you draw this primal graph and it ends up being a tree structure, that means I can do direct resolution very efficiently. We know a lot about the tree width of the various graphs and, and so on. So what I'm gonna say is uh, <clears throat> one more thing here quickly, uh, beyond ba bounding the space of directed resolution based on the tree width of its the primal graph, you can also use the primal graph to pick up a good variable ordering. And there is in your chapter uh, a, a method called the minfill heuristic, which operates on the graph to pick up a particular variable ordering that does well. Now, if we want to treat this tree width thing um, in detail, we will basically need about an hour. Um, we're not going to do this. Um, these are the highlights. We're going to come back to some of these later in other contexts, but the full details are in your chapter, if you're curious uh, about the full details of this. But otherwise, let's take our 10-minute break. And um, when we come back, there's one more topic on uh, directed resolution, and then we go into DPLL. Okay, we'll uh, start at 11.
Thank you.